Welcome to Underdog Talk. I'm your host, Eric Jones Jr., the underdog with the heroic heart. And I have conversations with successful underdogs. And today is no different than any other day. I have Savannah Johnson. She is a visionary, pan African spiritualist, educator, entrepreneur with over 28 years of international experience as the CEO of Ambrosia Nutrient and Beauty and is a behavior special uh, therapist specializing in children on the autism spectrum. She is dedicated to transforming lives through holistic health, plant-based nutrition and nutrient or natural remedies. Mm -hmm. uh, Savannah's mission is rooted to improve indiv empowering individuals and communities with natural and organic solutions for well-being while her work as an educator and entrepreneur serves as an inspiration to countless others pursuing wellness and entrepreneurship. How are you doing today? I'm excellent. Thank you for such a beautiful introduction. I appreciate that. No problem. I'll be trying to work on it um, and get better and better. Or I try to keep it short because I'm not that great at reading. And even though I love talking in front of people, I'd be nervous when I read. So it, it messes me <laughs> up. So, <laughs> yeah. So before we get started, I need a fun fact. Uh, fun fact about me is I love to ride horses. Hmm. I ain't never ever. Not no now. No. I don't think. I don't know. I'm kind of. I'm. I'm afraid. Horses and motorcycles. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm. I'm. Af I'm afraid. Um. Let's They're see. They're very gentle. They're very gentle. I'm trying to think. Did I ride on? I think a fun fact. I rode on an elephant before. See. Or I think I did. Or my dad and my sister for sure did. I don't know if I actually went up there, but we that that would be the fun fact. One of the, somebody in our family rode an elephant. That's the fun fact. Now I don't can't remember if it was me or not. But uh, yeah. So have you? Is that something that you do like on the regular, or that's just something you like to do? I like to do, and I am actually trying to put that into my schedule more and more. Oh, okay. It just, you liked it since a, like a younger kid? Yes, I've been writing for a long time since mm -hmm. I was smaller. Mm, okay. I uh, I had a guest on here. She did, um, what's it called? Is it 4-H? Uh, 4-H Club? Yeah, she did, that. she did that when she was younger. So I, I learned a lot when you have different people because I didn't, because I'm from Michigan City and, well, she's from like LaPorte, so it's close, but we didn't really have horses and riding stuff like that, but you saw them like being in the country, but I never knew that you could actually go do that. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, share with us the story behind, am, is, am I saying it right? Ambrosia? Ambrosia, nutrition and beauty. And tell us the story behind Ambrosia, nutrition and beauty. Okay, well, um, I officially started the company in 2023 mm -hmm. after um, years of experience as an herbalist, mm -hmm. um, recently returning to the States in 2015, mm -hmm. working and raising my family. Um, in 2023, I started my company, and it was a perfect time for me because I had just come out of a sabbatical. I wasn't working. And I had the actual time to put my recipes together, um, make sure that they were FDA compliant, mm -hmm. facility and sealed, and uh, get the paperwork and everything started to get my company moving. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so with being um, an educator over 28 years internationally, mm -hmm. uh, how was your experience as a educator and um, behavior specialist with children with autism like being because I know being here in the states and kind of working with those children mm -hmm. some of those children are foreign mm -hmm. that that have that so how was it like being somewhere else and um, and like being in education for all those years um, somewhere else? Actually, it was an, a wonderful experience. Um, I originally went to Northeastern Africa mm -hmm. to be the vice principal of a school there. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to later on invest time into teaching English and English as a second language. Okay. 
to um, Israelis and um, the Arab population there. Um, and that was, it was great. I had an opportunity to meet a lot of families who were in um, somewhat difficult situations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things going on in that region and whatnot. And I was, I was just able to tap into the people as far as education is concerned. Um, just helping to give back to my community wherever it is that I am. I think I answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what made you want to go international with education? Well, uh, I was in graduate school at Clark Atlanta University. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> a certain community offered me a position. I, I had always wanted to, my end goal was to be president of Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. So I took the position in an effort to uh, beef up my resume and uh, increase my level of experience as I was working on my master's degree in African studies. So I took the position in order to uh, really lock into what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. at that. So yeah. Went over there and did that. So when you got there, you're how old? You're in your 20s, right? Yes, I was in my early 20s. Early 20s. Very early 20s. Very 22, er 22. So, and you go into another, because, <clears throat> excuse me, my daughter, she is 19 and last year, so when she was 18, she went to Spain for, to, to as a like a foreign exchange kind of student because mm -hmm. she could speak Spanish but then going over there and then she went to the Dominican Republic so I know her going there just telling us our, her experience nothing crazy but just a different culture so how was it for you going over there and were you expecting to go over there and be there for almost 30 years uh, no, when I originally mm -hmm. went over there, again, it was to accept a position. Mm -hmm. I had intended to stay uh, maybe a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I was kind of negotiating in the agreement. That's what I thought I wanted to do. It was a wonderful experience. Northeastern Africa is very beautiful. Um, the sea, the sunshine, the Mediterranean lifestyle. Yeah. Um, all kinds of different cultures. It was wonderful experience. That portion of it was excellent. So how was it like the work part? Because I know it's probably you're young, you're going over there, you speak you speak the language, but you're going over there where everybody is speaking a different language than what you're normally. So how was it like the work part of it? Was there was there any challenges that you uh, had to endure like right when you got there? Or did it take some time for you to like have to... Um, overcome some challenges because working in education there's a challenge every day <laughs> uh, oh oh absolutely um some of the more challenging aspects uh were basically just trying to put together a proper team mm -hmm. um in order to execute being able to have the best school possible for um the children as far as the language is concerned um uh, for obvious reasons, colonization, everywhere you go, people speak English, mm -hmm. speak it, read it, and write it. Uh, street signs are generally speaking in English as well as whatever the language is of the country. Okay. So certain things about it um, were very relevant, or relevant. Mm -mm. evident is the word, were very evident. Um <clears throat> As far as learning of the language, I did take classes when I was there uh, in Hebrew. Um, I took some classes also in Arabic. Uh, I speak street Hebrew, though. <laughs> I speak street Hebrew, which means I learned to speak the language and read the language in real time as I was talking to people. Uh, the few classes that I definitely had absolutely helped, but I speak everyday Hebrew. <laughs> Yeah, got I you. learned over time just yep. putting things together and figuring it out. Yeah, that that's 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 amazing to be able to do that because it's like it's kind of hard because even like me say I've worked with someone that um, speaks Spanish like you can kind of you understand what they're saying or 
you know, you might not be able to pronunciate the word, but you get, oh, okay, they're talking about this, they're talking about that. But for you to pick it up and be able to pronunciate, because I, that's one thing I can't, I'm not a good uh, person of foreign, foreign language. But I was talking to somebody and I didn't, we didn't realize when we were in school how much of an important speaking another language really is. Absolutely. And like, they tell you to do it, but they don't really tell you like, Hey, you speak another language that could add some more dollars to your paycheck. Like they just tell you, oh, okay, you're supposed to take it to graduate. But if you actually take a language and you're able to master that, then you really like being bilingual is really helpful. So, um, <clears throat> When you, when you're, when you're over there, when you're, when you're teaching, what were some of, um, the challenges with your students? Hmm, some of the challenges with my students, um, well, it's a lot different than what I would see over here. First being bi and even trilingual is normalized in a, most countries. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not only going to speak their home language, they're also going to be fluent in English and possibly one or two other languages. So uh, it is definitely a normalized situation to come upon communities and whole nations of people that speak two and three languages fluently. Um, some of the challenges where it's basically just trying to tap into the spirit of the language. Mm. Because English is kind of, it can be very deceptive. It's very difficult to learn. Mm -hmm. And in teaching it, you have to be able to um, translate effectively the thought into what the person that you're teaching can relate to mm. in their language. So... Learning uh, Hebrew at the same time as I was teaching English was um, very interesting and really quite effective. Uh, the most difficult part about it would be actually just getting to uh, the people that really wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. um, busy schedules, different locations, um, cultural celebrations certain times a year, um, ongoing political activities, um, that might make it a little bit more difficult. But other than that, it was really a joy. That portion was a joy. How was, like, adjusting living-wise, like, going to a whole, like, because there's different cultures over there, there's different foods. Did you have to, like, change how you dressed, anything of that sort? Um... Western clothing is basically everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, as far as going to different countries and changing your clothing, uh, depends on exactly what the state of the country is. Most places you're going to be able to wear Western clothing. Um, the, the community that hired me mm -hmm. to come to help to open the school, um, had their own particular culture that they wore, and um, which was perfectly fine. I dressed according to the culture. Okay. Yeah, because I know, excuse me, certain places, you know, they uh, dress a little different. So how was the food? Excellent. 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 Um when I went over there, well, before I went over there, I'd started learning about plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. The community that I went over to work with had been completely plant-based and is still completely plant-based. So I ended up having to learn how to prepare uh, plant-based dishes and things like that in order to incorporate my, my ex existence and my experience being over there. It was really, really great. Um, in general, I found that the food is cleaner and purer, much more access to organic foods, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was great. I learned how to shop at a shuk, which is a huge open market, and you learn how to buy things in bulk mm -hmm. and pick the very best of the fruits and the vegetables. And here was olive oil if you want the very best of the fruit and vegetables. I learned how to do that. So it was great. That's that's good. That uh, I just had somebody 
else on that um, talks about plant based, and they were saying how in other countries their kind of food is better um, than it is here because a lot of stuff isn't um, chemicalized already. Right. Like it's just right there, and they don't have to. Sh- uh, ship it off or anything like that so that's good so were you kind of eating that food before you went you say you you kind of looked it up or whatever but were you or were you just went over there and like oh i'm just gonna try something that's over here no i had been introduced to a plant-based diet by uh, a young brother who was also a member of the community at the time and he worked in the kitchens of the restaurants Mm -hmm. that the community owned. And he basically taught me different recipes and things. So, you know, once you know better, you try to do better if you're smart. Yeah. So once I started learning about um, the effects of a plant-based diet, I jumped right on it. I jumped right on it, and I cycled myself out of eating uh, chicken and, wait, no, pork and beef first and then i cycled myself out of eating chicken and mm. fish last mm. mm-hmm. it, yeah it works you have to kind of learn how to to prepare the food as you're going so that you can sustain yourself so i was able to do that and it worked out just great still plant-based yeah how, how so how long you've been plant-based since 1992 mm. that's in that sounds weird to me. Not that, mm-hmm. but you I didn't really. No, no, no. Not not that you are, but that you were since the nineties. Like you don't really hear about people eating healthy or plant based food. I feel like me or just now. I'm just hearing about these kind of. I mean, you hear about it, you know about it, but where you're actually seeing people, where you're seeing people eat it, or you're seeing people grow it, like recently so for someone to been doing this since the 90s that's really dope because you don't i feel like we within the last maybe 10 years or less you hear about vegans and eating healthy and plant-based and all this stuff like i don't feel like i heard it back then you might have been one of the only people because i was just talking i was just really thinking like back in the day nobody was eating healthy but everybody was wondering why they was going to the doctors and all that. Like, we were not eating healthy, mm-hmm. drinking Kool-Aid, drinking pop, all these different things. And been, for somebody to have been eating healthy <clears throat> since the 90s, I think that's dope. Because you really don't, you catch a few people here and there. Well, I guess it depends on what side of the world you live on, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, It does, it does. It's a natural part of the diet of a lot of cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, in the community... They've been plant-based since the early 70s. So Mm. I know uh, quite a large group of people that are generations in Mm. to veganism. Definitely veganism and vegetarianism. It's a normalized thing in in that part of the world. Yeah, because when you, like, if you see sometimes you see older, like, in their hundreds, you see people mostly Mm -hmm. be in a foreign country, it's because of what they're eating and all those things. So, with your 28 years, you're over there, what are one or two challenges that you had to face where only you could face them even though you were over there in a different country? Um, Challenges would have come along with and did come along with um, status issues for myself Mm -hmm. in this country. Uh, That was the largest challenge that I had the entire when I was over there is facing status issues. So explain like what do you mean by with status issues? Uh, Basically being in the country legally, Mm -hmm. moving around legally. under the ordinances of visas and the structure of passports and things like that. So is it kind of like you, in a sense, felt how when people come over here from a different country here? Mm -hmm. So it's like... Absolutely. Mm Yeah. Absolutely. That's exactly what it was like. So so do you feel more sympathy for them after dealing with that yourself? Um, Or is it not that big of an issue? Or is it, you know, is it something where you like, oh, I get why they you know how they feel or things like that because you have people come over here for a lot of people come over here for the right reasons they hear you're supposed to get the american dream and all these different things and come to america's good but then they come over here and have to deal with a lot of the bs so 
you being in the other, you being vice versa, did you, did you feel like how they, you know, how they felt in, in that way? Yes. I had a, quite an intimate experience with regards to being like that. And, um, it has created in me the insight that really at the end of the day, the earth doesn't belong to anyone. Mm -hmm. And everyone is basically sovereign. Should there be an order to movement and identification? Yes. However, uh, this earth it was here before we came. It's going to be here long after we're gone. Mm -hmm. And to uh, fool ourselves into thinking that uh, there's an ownership or a claim that's real uh, is kind of borderline delusional. Mm -hmm. Do you want to love where you're born? Do you want to be nationalistic? Do you want to be patriotic? Absolutely. But not to the exclusion of understanding what it is to be human and um, relative to just moving around on this earth. So yes, I can definitely relate. Because there's different circumstances and situations for everyone. And people who are not or have never been and probably never will be in those circumstances and situations um, wouldn't understand. Yeah. I, I, they, could I, they should try to, though. Yeah. They should definitely try to. Yeah, definitely. Because I, I take it as for me being me and in my situation, there's not a lot of people that really ever – be like, take a second and be like, hmm, wonder what it's like to be uh, Eric or have dealt with this or someone that's known me all these years of like taking that time to really be like, man, wonder what it's like because you know, like you said, everybody's situation different. And like, that's why I like having the podcast because you get to hear different people's stories. And sometimes when you hear somebody's story, you sitting there looking at your life like, oh, I, I, my shit cool. I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm listening to this person like, dang, how did you get through that? Like, even like, because somebody would look at me and be like, man, how does he get through that? And I look at somebody like, how the heck did you get through that? Like, I don't want to go through that. And people don't take the time to actually consider it until you're in a similar situation or you're going through something and then you'd be like, oh, okay, like, or it's like seeing a homeless person. You might not have never been homeless, but you done been on that line of almost mm -hmm. being there. So you like, man, ooh, I'm glad I don't got to be there, but I don't, you know, you want to maybe talk to that person. How did they get there or anything like that? So that's, that's good to kind of be able to experience something that somebody else, that someone normally from the U.S. wouldn't have to deal with, but to be able to experience so you can see it on both sides. Because when you see things on both sides, it gives you a different perspective on life of, being a little more nicer and being more caring to somebody. Absolutely. Humanity, uh, we need that. We need for people to generate another love for people and for humanity. So, um, my segment, I, it's new. I've only done like two or three because I started it uh, since I just started. Who's your favorite underdog? So, I'm going to ask you... Um, a list of questions, and you just tell me who your favorite underdog comes up with. Okay. Who is your favorite historical underdog that have inspired you? Mm, that's a really good question. Who is my favorite historical underdog? That would have to be Harriet Tubman. Mm, I like that. Mm-hmm. Who is your favorite athlete or public figure that embodies underdog spirit? Muhammad Ali. Is there, do you have a favorite fictional um, underdog that you admire? A favorite fictional underdog that I admire. Oh my goodness, there's so many. There's so, so many. I don't know if I could pick one. <laughs> I don't know if I could pick one because we, are, we as a people, have written so many beautiful, beautiful uh, works of art. Um, favorite underdog? Uh, man. Shoot, just by anybody in the books from Miss Zora Neale Hurston. Okay. Um, 
Um, who uh, is your favorite underdog in business? Me. <laughs> no, it's hey, I love it. It's always it's always one question that uh, somebody can say themselves. And uh, who's your favorite underdog educator? My favorite underdog educator. Hmm. From all kinds of different TED Talks and different seminars that I've seen in education, there, there are just so many. You've got... Uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, you've got um, Angela Davis, you've got uh, Dr. Umar. You've there are just quite a few people who've been standards for years mm -hmm. um, in education. And when you come into solid education, that's as far as like um, the actual teaching of certain academic courses that people would kind of not know their names. There's, there's thousands yeah. of, of teachers <clears throat> and instructors and educators that can, that fit that bill for me that are just awesome. Very inspiring people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I take, I, being an educator and actually working in the schools and seeing the people in the schools, it's like you take a, a different liking for like certain teachers and educators because some people are there just to be there. They're just there just to say that they got a job. But then you have some people that actually care and want to be like that, that student superhero or somebody that is going to help them get to the le next level or that person that you, that kid is going to remember mm -hmm. years down the line, like being on the inside of the school, you definitely can see the, uh, the ins and outs. It's not as, it's not as pretty as people think it is or as easy as people think it is. But I do have a question. <clears throat> um, what is Dr. And Umar, what does he like? What does he teach? Like, what is he, what is his thing? Oh man! Like, cause I, cause I hear him, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but I hear him, and I see, I, I kind of know what he talks about, but I've never had someone that actually like maybe mentioned his name that would know, like, could explain it. So, what is like, um, who is he? Well, Doctor Umar is basically um, a Pan African nationalist who has developed his own understanding through years of study. He has his doctorate. Mm -hmm. and he's put together an educational system and a school mm -hmm. um, that's definitely worth looking into. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he educates our people with regards to uh, an African nationalist culture. Mm -hmm. It's a mindset that you have to have relative to First, empowering yourself with proper information so that you can be stabilized and understanding uh, how you see things from a Pan-Africanist perspective, a pro-black perspective, a pro-man perspective, a pro-woman perspective under that umbrella, pro-family, uh, pro-culture. Mm -hmm. And then he eloquently pushes those thoughts forward um, in an offering of understanding so that people could kind of learn a little bit more, grasp uh, information about diet, clothes, relationship, um, finances, mm -hmm. and builds from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's a, a pen african Like, could you, like, explain that for maybe someone that doesn't know what that particularly is? Well... A Pan-Africanist is someone who basically understands and wants to continue to learn more about the support of an African culture and mindset internationally. Okay. Because sometimes I think, I, sometimes I I want to know or I'm thinking of like the audience, maybe it might be somebody that doesn't know what a particular topic. So I try to, try to remember to... Uh, let it be explained so people can, you know, understand a little bit more. So what's your, um, 
with your time over there, did you ever think you were going to come back or did you want to stay over there? Well, with my time in Israel, um, I, at a certain point in time, I absolutely did want to come back. Mm -hmm. Um, I ended up having, I I was delayed by quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I ended up having to go through all kinds of different hoops and endeavors in order to be able to return back to the States. Mm. So when you return, excuse me, what was that like? And what was your, excuse me, your plan when you got back? What were what was the next step of you were you were in another country, you've been over there for some time, you're coming back. What was like your plan and like how was that adjusting adjustment coming back? Well, the first time I returned from the States, my plan was to work and come up with some options uh, for myself that I could put into place that would benefit myself and my family, specifically myself and my children. Mm -hmm. Um, Returning to the States, uh, especially this last return, because I went back and forth Mm -hmm. several times, returning back to the States this last time in 2015, I brought my children with me. Mm And that's been very, very interesting because so much has changed for our people, especially our youth. Mm -hmm. Um, My children were raised in another type of environment. Mm -hmm. That if you watch the news, you would think is far more uh, violent or backwards Mm -hmm. than it actually is. Mm -hmm. Um, Returning back to the States with them, bringing them here, I wanted them to be able to meet their family members, their grandparents, which they've been able to do, my brothers, my sisters, their father's family, uh, in order to be able to get a real good understanding of what it is to be an Mm African-American. As opposed to an African whose parents were from America. Mm. So they came back and um, the adjustment for them, I watched as a parent. You know, they, they were younger. I, they were teenagers. And then I had grade schoolers as well. Mm-hmm. So having to shepherd them through all kinds of things that they didn't understand, yeah. uh, different levels of violence. They didn't understand the, the diet. Um uh, why people would eat certain things, like why would they eat that? Because my children have never uh, consumed meat. Uh, now, would they be able to try it? Sure. I know that um, my daughter went to kindergarten. This was in, in Israel, and uh, she wanted to try a bite of a tuna fish sandwich. So her teacher called me and was like, I know y'all are plant-based, can't she? I said, sure. You know, I'm not here to stop her from experiencing certain things. I'm here to offer her the best. Mm -hmm. And as she continues to grow, she's going to be the one that's going to choose. Yeah. So I'm sure she tried it. I never got a request for it. She (laughs) never asked me. Yeah. So um, being open to experiences is something that I I don't mind for my children. Um, so they, they've learned a lot. They've learned a lot, uh, especially being uh, African-American men. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've yeah. learned a lot about how to move around, yeah. um, <clears throat> what to say, what not to say, because basically and fundamentally the environment can potentially be dangerous at any moment, whereas where they grew up, yeah, not so much. Yeah. Not so much. Uh, and that's... And, like, hearing that, you would think it, like, almost vice versa. Like, when you hear of other countries, you people make it seem like it's so, some of them are so bad and so, oh, I wouldn't go there. But then you hear people that actually visit or live there. And they're like, it's so beautiful. It's this and that. And it's like, it's just a perception of the media and the news of what they, they tell you. Because 
you live there. I haven't heard you. I mean, I'm sure there's bad stuff that happened and all well, that. But mythical. Yeah, yeah there's but bad it's people like, exist. <laughs> but then them coming over here and it's like you saying, being a black man, I don't think. I don't think people realize how hard it is. Like any person, not because you start a topic and you got to throw women, you got to throw, but as a black man, it's really hard because it, especially your figure, if you're a tall, strong, dark skin, got dreads, people be like, Oh, he's a thug. He's this and that. And you'd be like, no, he, he's, he, a doctor. he's yeah, he's a doctor. He's a, <laughs> it's actually a doctor that looks like that. That's, um, there's several. Yeah, several. that um, does he? Uh, I don't remember because he's doing an event. But yeah, it's like you have certain people, but then you try to go out and then say if, like you said, if you're in a could be at the wrong place at the wrong time where somebody's being disrespectful, but you just defending yourself or your family and they take it the wrong way. And it's like, why is like why do I have to deal like that because of my skin is black? So I know that was definitely hard because my son he's albino, mm -hmm. so he. He just looks light skinned, but when he was younger, he was like, Oh, I'm white. And I'm like, No, you, you're not. Because guess what? If they pull you over, guess what? You, you, you like me, brother. And he didn't get it. He didn't get it because he, it took to, I think, George Floyd passing away. And he was like, They wouldn't do nothing to me. I look like them. I was like, No, you don't. I was like, And I had to break it down and explain it to him. So being, uh, a black man in America or having black son in America is very difficult to have to sit down and explain those kind of conversations to your kid. And they're probably like, mom, why do we got to do it? We ain't, we ain't used to this. And it's like, that's just the world we live in. And it, and it sucks that we have to have those kind of conversations with our kids at an early age. Like well, he was, yeah, a kid. he was young. It's yeah. Realizing when you look at the statistics, uh, the United States is by far the most violent country in the world that doesn't have an active war going on on its land. Yeah. And you go to other places and you realize it's not like it is here. Yeah. It's not like it is here. Uh, and that's something that you can definitely feel the energy of. Um, interestingly... Mm -hmm. I found that there have been people who actually would take, uh, like, for example, my sons. Mm -hmm. And they might think, oh, man, they're not street. If you ain't raised in the street, you don't have no street cred. You are not able to defend yourself <laughs> Or, you know, some kind of way you're behind the eight ball yeah. without understanding what being valuable really, really is. And yeah. what it is to be in a traumatized situation that you have, a traumatizing situation that is actually normalized. Yeah. And it's like, you're looking at people, if they haven't been traumatized and conditioned the same way you have, yeah. something's wrong with you. Yeah. You can look at it in our music industry. Uh Com completely yeah uh it's something's wrong with you if if some kind of way you're not deeply traumatized yeah <laughs> and and you know yeah i was just talking i w i think it might have been the last podcast like is and you don't realize it till you get some till you get out of the poverty mindset that like that's stupid why are we praising people? Oh, if you didn't struggle, if you didn't grow up without no air conditioner, if you didn't have no heat, if you didn't have these struggles of the hood, then you, you're you corny. No, it means my parents did what the hell they were supposed to, and your parents struggled. Like, if I live on this side of the tracks, I was born to these people. They got me on these side of the tracks. Why are you uh, calling me corny or saying, oh, I can't hang out with you because I live over here because your parents live, because y'all live in the projects. Uh, it's it's other stuff outside of the projects, or is is like uh like you said in the music. Everybody, so everybody trap, everybody in the hood, everybody got a gun, everybody just ghetto. No, everybody's not. So why are y'all just rapping about stuff that we normalize? Like you said, we normalize. If you not, if you didn't, if your dad was in the house, you, you looked at it a certain way or a certain. It's like why do we think like that? Because I'm sure when you go. 
when you go to other cultures, they don't think like that. They don't think, oh, because your family didn't have the money to buy the Jordans, we're going to make fun of you or we're going to talk about you. No, I, I, I don't get that. I, I, I still don't get that. That's like I got my car a few years ago, got my car uh, stolen. And people were like, why would you leave your car running uh, to go in the gas station? Why can't I leave my car running to go in the gas station? Why do I have to be worried that somebody's going to steal my car? Like, that sounds... I mean, it's the reality that we live in, but that sounds stupid when you really think about it. Like, I literally go to work, buy a car, and go in somewhere and run out, and I can't even do that because what? Because somebody, some little man, man, and then want to come and steal my car. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense to me of why we think like that, and it, it and it's so stupid because the kids nowadays they think that's cool. It's like. That's not cool. Y'all live in the suburbs. Be like the kids in the suburbs. You don't want to be like the kids in, from around the way because you don't know what kind of struggles they deal with. And I, I just, I don't get why. Well, I get why because of past trauma, but we got to get out of that mindset of if you haven't struggled, if you haven't been broke before, then it makes it seem like your life ain't significant because you didn't go through the struggles of that. I don't want to go through them struggles. Well, that's why we have to normalize therapy. Mm -hmm. We have to normalize and define another type of culture for ourselves as a people. We can do that. Um, when we think about um, African-American culture, mm -hmm. say, uh, give me... Top three things that represent African American culture to you: music, food, mm, and surviving. Okay. All right. Let's think of top three things in Asian culture: mm, work, um, education. And family oriented. Okay. I could continue to name cultures, but right there you can see the difference. Mm -hmm. As African Americans, we can take our culture mm -hmm. and upgrade it. We can actively upgrade it into something that benefits us as a people. Mm -hmm. Because, again, like you were saying, when people think about our culture, when we think about our culture, music, Food. Okay, how are those things beneficial to us? Mm -hmm. You name another culture, it's like the three things that you named all benefit the people directly. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to change that underlying question or answer that underlying question, yes, we've got a lot of systemic trauma that we're dealing with, and we have to address that with therapy, uh, dietary upgrades. And just understanding that we can evolve our culture ourselves. We don't have to wait for somebody to change that. We can normalize saying, okay, why can't African Americans be the healthiest people in America? Yeah, because we, we... We got bought over here because we can handle the workload. Yeah. For whatever reason, we excel at certain areas. But when it comes... I so why not just make it a part of yep. our culture? Okay, let's just say it's a part of our culture. We drink water. We, we, we like to drink water. We exercise as a part of our culture. Each person understands that a certain amount of hours a week, we got to work out whatever that is. We're going to move our bodies and work out, okay? Um, we were the builders of this country. We built this country. When you have that kind of power in your hands, why can't we make that a normalized part of our culture that everyone gets a trade? Whether you learn to braid hair, whether it's electricity, plumbing, even if you learn it from your, your aunt or your uncle or your father or your mother, something productive so that you can put your hand to the hand of the hoe and go ahead and, and till and fertilize your community if some elders need help with building They've got a plethora of young men and women to help them. If there's um, a physical issue, uh, we've got young men and women or men and women to help with that within our culture. So I think we can go ahead and start to plug in certain things that we would like to see take place. Mm -hmm. And as we're doing that, we shuffle out other kinds of, of 
thoughts that might and programming that might hold us back. Yeah, that 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 is true. Um, because the last person I had on, um, one of the founders of Body Buzz, and he was telling me how as black people we're one of the unhealthiest people, and that goes back to when we when I was thinking about how I grew up in the nineties and the early the late eighties and nineties, like all the food that we were eating, like nobody was eating healthy. Like I literally don't remember, and I could, and I, my memory could be off. I don't remember people having water bottles. My mom might have had water bottles, but I don't necessarily remember. I remember people having pop and Kool Aid and and all this stuff. Like as a kid going outside, I don't even remember. Like when did we stop and go eat? We didn't. We just was outside, and and that was part of the being the healthy part, being outside a lot and doing that. So that kind of outweighed the eating bad. But we we ate horrible, and we didn't realize it until you see somebody or somebody gets cancer or somebody gets sick. Now the doctor's like, well, you need to change your diet. When we've been knowing we should have been changed our diet, but it takes to some dramatic change in our life for us to be like oh well i need to start doing this or uh like you see the smokers commercial and the people got the uh, uh, mm -hmm. you you should have been known that that you needed to stop or just drinking water or just working out those are things that we know because we do all the bad things we 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 know if we from around the way and we know we need to we know how to hit a lick we know how to do the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. We know how to do the good stuff, but we just don't want to. And then we'll make an excuse or we'll blame uh, America. We'll blame another culture of why things are happening to us. And it's like, no, look in the mirror. Like we have to make a change. And it's like we make a change for five minutes. And then it's like, oh, it's just like <clears throat> Juneteenth. Juneteenth comes. Mm -hmm. More people know about it now. It's, it's a holiday. It's not really a holiday. It was hot for a second because y'all we still red, white, and blue. You got the uh, 4th of July parade and all that, but we don't take into consideration our holiday is Juneteenth. Let's stop doing what the 4th of July and all that corny. I don't want to get too. I don't want to get where people, you know, get mad at me for what I say, but all that corny stuff that don't apply to us, black people. I'm not talking to anybody else. I'm talking to us melanin people and actually spend the time on the stuff that is for us or like with black history month. Oh, black history month more than just black history month. Is it? Because nobody says anything after black history month. Mm -hmm. Nobody says anything after, you know, even in black history month, like I've worked in schools, they don't talk about it. So if we don't do anything about it, how can we blame other people or how we can, we keep making excuses. We know racism going to last forever. It's not going to change. So we can't keep saying, Oh, it's racism. We know that that's there. So it's like we have to actually look in the mirror and make the changes of like what you were saying. Like, let's be a culture of working out. Let's be a culture of of drinking water or or Isn't education yeah. or whatever, whatever exactly. that may be to be something different that we can leave a legacy for our kids. If you look at <clears throat> and not to go along with it, but how everybody's hating on LeBron and his son, any other culture does that all the time. They have a high position or they make some money. Hey, son, come on. You're going to go work with the family. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? Like, we got to stop hating each other for doing great stuff. I don't care how it looks to you. If it looked corny to you, stop hating on people because that's the only way that we're going to be able to succeed as a culture is to congratulate, is to be happy that people are doing something, no matter what it looks like, no matter who it is, what name it is, because that's a part of our downfall. You do anything good or bad, somebody's going to say something. It don't matter who it is. It's like, dang, I can't, I, I, I didn't say 15 people in, in, in this house, but y'all still got something bad to say about me. I just don't, I don't get our culture with that. Well, <clears throat> First of all, you, we need to consider systemic issues. Yep. And the fact that um, our descendants came, for, some of our descendants were already here. Mm -hmm. A lot of our descendants came through the slave trade. And we were intentionally, as we all know, robbed of certain things. Now we're starting to see the importance 
of the fact that somebody sat back and said, oh, we can't let them have a culture. We have to take that away. They can't speak their language. They can't have their own holidays or holy days. They can't have family structures that are solid. They can't make them any money. We can't teach them how to read or write. They're strictly for chattel to work. And for people to be put in the position of basically having the same value as this table Mm -hmm. uh, is psychologically very damaging Mm -hmm. and traumatizing. And then we get into the generational portions of it. So what we're seeing now is for this period of time, the result of years of generational trauma. That's why therapy is very important. And that's why... I feel that we need to look at certain aspects of our culture and consciously upgrade them. There are places on this planet where um, people have been known to live way longer than average people in other places. There's a congruent um, reason why their diet, uh, their spiritual connection, to each other, their their spiritual connections to source, um, all kinds of, of different ways that would contribute to just our culture elevating that have already been set into a pattern from other cultures. All we have to do is, is look at it. You mean if we spend more time with our elders consciously? Mm-hmm. Spending time with your elders and sitting down just watching TV, listening to what they have to say. Throughout this process, our elders have been devalued now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't do that. As a, it, No culture can elevate and dog its children and its elders. Yep. You can't go anywhere with that. So all the killing on one end and the, the abuse on the other end and the, the lack of consideration or planning for our elders and our children is something that we're going to have to consciously decide, no, we're not going to do that as a culture anymore, as a people anymore. We respect our elders. We respect our children. I'm starting to see a sea change, and I'm happy about that because I do think that we as a people are looking around and deciding, okay, wait a minute. This music is definitely not beneficial. It's harming us. The beats might sound good, but now we've figured out there's a science to that. Yeah. There's a science to that. And it's been implemented on us quite well to the point where certain beats come on, you start entering into that self-destructive mentality, and then you move on from there. Why can't we reverse that and use healing tones in our music, we know what those are, and certain artists have already started doing that. Um, diet. Our people were the farmers. Yeah. We were the agriculturalists. One of the reasons why diet is so bad is because of food deserts. So at this point, why can't it be a, a part of our culture for each family to have? Even if you don't have a yard, get a pot. Grow some tomatoes. Grow some peppers, grow some onions. You can grow herbs right in your home. Yeah. Okay. We could do seed giveaways, things like that. We definitely have community gardens. They should be valued. Um, definitely. Definitely. Different, different, all kinds of different things relative to relationships. We can decide about that yeah. as a part of our culture. Yeah. How, how to, okay, how is this going to work with the ratio differences between viable African-American men and viable African-American women. Mm -hmm. How are we going to deal with that? We need to start talking about those things instead of personal issues Yep. and feelings. Yep. We have to start getting into more programs that are going to benefit us. And for people to to kind of check that, no, man, we don't do that. Yep. Mm Mm-mm, sis, no. We're not doing that. That's not where we're at at this point. Times is different. And that doesn't mean to judge somebody because they're not doing it the way you would like to do it. First, you be the example how you would like to see it go down. Make sure your children are trained up in that way. Do your kids drink water? Do y'all eat vegetables? Are you growing anything in your home? Mm -hmm. You know, those types of things, communicating and spending time. And that's how you get things on the move with it. Yeah, like you, you just said a lot that can help. 
Because I'm thinking of me. When I was younger, I was around my grandparents. Mm -hmm. Maybe not by choice per se, but I was around them. And as I got older, like, like, dang, man, granny ain't around. Like, just spending that time of watching, like you said, watching Law & Order, drinking tea, making a puzzle, doing a crossword, mm -hmm. and just just talking to them. Because these kids, they don't, they don't, some of, I ain't going to say all of them, but a good portion, like, they don't realize that they got, elders in their family like they don't call them like i always tell my son call your granny call call your g-pop check on them make sure they straight because you because you never know as you as we get older you know anybody could anybody could go now everybody that leave their house don't always make it back and just not uh taking the time out to value the older generation because they've went through so much Without the technology, they'll help you be up like their stories can help you get through that. And then I just remember being younger and my grand granny had a little garden out there mm -hmm. or in school. You you planted something. Mm -hmm. They were teaching you that like at an early age. So you kind of knew those things, but they do take it away. And like you said, therapy is very important. I got a therapy session at eight o'clock tonight. Like that is like and people think that is weird. No, it's really you just sitting there talking. You just getting whatever you get off your chest and they can make the, the so that you can see what kind of issues go on in your life. I hate that people don't, that don't want to do therapy. Like it's very beneficial. Like it's nothing wrong. We got to get out of that. Uh, what happens in our house, stay in our house. Cause a lot of stuff that happened in the house shouldn't, shouldn't have happened in the house. It needs to be outside the house so somebody can be protected. So just those little things that you were saying, um, it, people getting off their feelings. If you're consistent, if we're consistent with the things you talked about, we'd be a way better culture. Just those little things, dieting, uh, talking to our elders, valuing the children. Cause these children, they don't feel value. So they just go out and kill each other and do stupid stuff. Every time you turn on the news and somebody that's a teenager, didn't kill somebody or got killed because are those things that you were just talking about, we don't implement. And then it's somebody will be like, oh, well, why y'all not doing it this way? Are, are you doing it the right way? Why are you coming at me? Why you why you have an opinion on me and you ain't got the, the plank out your eye? I never understand that with people because I catch myself at home. If I see someone on social, I'm like, ooh, what well, they did say? I'm like, oh, that's none of my business. Let me keep moving because there's no point for me to judge somebody else and I'm not doing everything that I'm supposed to do. And I feel like in our culture, we judge people because they doing something that we're scared to do. If you look at sports, the way that people talk about people uh, or you read the comment section and all these people have so much negative 90% of the people that got a comment can't do what these people do. So if you can't do something somebody can't do, or if you're not willing to be the first person to do it, shut up. Just shut up and do whatever you need to do for your life. Because it's always, it takes that one person to make that leap in the neighborhood. And then everybody, oh yeah, they want to jump on. Why you can't be the first person? Why you can't be the person that leads the pack to do something different? Or it takes... Um, somebody else to do it and now you want to say oh I'm a part of it it's just like uh, Tevin he's doing the books I'm helping I don't need my name nowhere on there I'm, it's for the kids mm -hmm. like I, my um, son's mother has the south side and he couldn't be there today so I went and gave a little introduction helped them out I ain't got to go back there I don't got to say nothing I don't need nobody to say my name it's about the kids we helping you don't always got to have your name out there for you to feel like you done something God know what you did and the kids know what you did that's all that matters sometimes we want a, a, a big old sign and oh yeah you did it no recognition yeah you don't need that just do whatever you're supposed to do for your heart from your heart and you'll be able to do better but what all those things that you were just saying just the little the little things that we don't do as a culture is what's really affecting our culture and it really sucks that it does because sometimes you know how uh, you watch social media and it, it's the black person but then you watch it be like it's just gotta be us huh we just couldn't get it together and it's like when are we gonna get it together we can't keep pointing the finger at some other race we know how they gonna treat us we know what they gonna do like at some point we gotta look at ourselves and say how can we change and be like some of these other cultures that you're talking about that's family oriented 
education, all those different things that we would like to be, which we are in a sense, but we're not in a whole. Because every other, not every culture, but there's a lot of cultures that would want to be like us. But in our reality, we want to be like them because we only so much. Well, isn't to me? It's just a natural part of humanity. If you're intelligent, you're gonna want to absorb what's good for you. Yeah. Regardless of of where it's coming from, if it's good for you, you want to absorb it and you want to upgrade. Mm -hmm. The thing is not to fight the absorption or the upgrade based on who the messenger is or whoever's bringing you the message. Um, everybody I know that's older has been a child, so we should be able to relate <laughs> to caring for children. Yep. If you're intelligent, you want to inspire to live long enough to be an elder, yep. and then eventually to be an, an, an excellent ancestor, okay? Those are things that you have to start to instill in children. For example, when they're smaller, I taught my children, all right, as you guys are growing up, make decisions that are going to benefit you today when you're 20. Start thinking about, okay, is as a part of your conscious thinking process, what can you do? What kind of decisions can you make today that are going to benefit you down the line as far as investing in yourself, yep. in, in yourself? Um, what you were talking about relative to violence in our neighborhoods and things like that, well, I don't know of any young people that own gun companies. <laughs> No. I, don't, I don't know of any young people that own them, um, ranges, stores, things like that. Those things are also systemic. Yep. Now, gun rights, should we be able to have weapons or not? That's definitely a debate, but uh, sh for me, I feel like people should be able to have a basic course of training. For example, where I was... Upon graduating, when I lived internationally, upon graduating, it's a normal part of their system and their culture for the young men and women that are graduating from high school to go into the service. Mm -hmm. uh, men, young men do three years, young women do two years, and there's different branches of the service that you can go into. You can go into combat, you can go into education, and that's just a part of the society. Mm -hmm. You're trained to operate weapons, respect weapons, protect people, all kinds of different situations that you would go through being a part of the, the military, mm -hmm. uh, you would be able to get that and absorb that if we had that kind of society as far as being able to make young people more responsible for weapons and weapons handling. You have to train them. But now it's just to, for example, in the state of Indiana, if you're 18, you can get a weapon. Mm -hmm. No training. And that's okay. And what's really out there is 18-year-olds didn't vote for that. Yeah. Far more mature people voted that that should be okay. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at that. Yeah. Why would, why would older people want children, basically, when you're, when you're over 18, you realize 18, 19, 20, 21... Still children yeah. on a certain level. You're still young. Yeah. Yep. You're still, why would you do that? Yep. Yep. Without any kind of training. Not. It's not like, okay, we're going to train you to show you this is how you take care of the weapon. This is the, the mentality you have to have behind the weapon. These are the weapons that are available to you, whatever, whatever. This is the process for that. It's like, no, here, would you give a baby a knife? Mm -mm. So again, those are things that we can take back. That could be that could be the law, but as a people, we could use that law if we wanted to. We could just say, okay, well, guns are available for anybody to purchase at 18, but it's a part of our culture that we're going to be training 
our young men and women how to responsibly handle a weapon so that no one gets hurt, how to responsibly store a weapon so that no one gets hurt. And then we're going to proactively have a security system basically in everyone's house because everybody's intelligently weapons trained. That could be a part of our culture in this society. All we have to do is decide that. Yeah, yeah. As a people. So it can be diet. It can be exercise. It could be something like weapons training, um, how to care for elders, agriculture, grow a little something, spend time with your grandparents Mm -hmm. and your elders in your community. Some people don't have grandparents. Yeah. My mom used to take me to the um, senior citizen's home where she volunteered. When I was little, I used to go in and tag along with her, but she said, it's very important for you to see this. I remember when I was little, it's very important for you to see this because one day this is going to be you and you got to sow those seeds, Mm -hmm. you know, come in and serve the elders of your community and embrace that. Because if you're lucky, you'll get mature enough to where, you, you know, you can look back over time and have some kind of experience and competence based on the fact that you survived certain things and thrived. So. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> to, to what you is, I'm going back to what you said before I last spoke, but I was just thinking of even the, the thugs and gang, gang bangers when I was younger, like they even had some type of, Cold or prime. Cold, yeah. Like you see, you see kids. You don't mess with kids. You don't mess with women. You don't mess with older people. Like nah, they, like you said, nobody know how to shoot. Like everybody got a gun, but don't nobody know how to shoot. You didn't. You you shooting at the person right in front of you. You didn't hit two, three people over here because you don't know what to do. But you cool. You wanna, uh, you wanna have you know have your gun out and think. That's how most people die. They shooting at the wrong person. Like there's no nobody knows how to actually use it. Or is we're in a we're in the times where like wherever you go, somebody got the, there's people on it. We me and my friends we were out and I told them I was like, all right, so listen, we see any buffoonery, we getting up out of here. Like I'm I I want to make yeah. it home. So we see it was a younger crowd. I mean I'm only 38, but that's borderline getting older so you could tell like somebody in their 20s they 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 a little young and you like okay and i told them i was like we see anybody with the little pooh shiesty hoodie on we see anybody looking kind of weird we getting up out of here and we seen a group of dudes clip hanging way out what you need all that for yep come on let's go i don't want nobody getting the arguing or none of that because all it takes is an argument and somebody that had a strap and get to shooting and then bullets don't got names on it but i just I really hate that we're in that times where everyone has to walk around with a gun because there's civilians like myself. I ain't never shot a gun. I don't even know if I can because my hand mobility. So what I'm supposed to do if it's gun shooting? I I just got to run and get up out of there. I can't shoot back at nobody. Like when my car got robbed, like if I was able to shoot or had a gun to do, head would have been blown away because I would have been able to just, hey, get out of my car. Boom. So it's like, the time, like it's just crazy. The times that we live in, that everyone has to have a weapon on them just to go outside, just to go to the gas station, just to go to the grocery store. But we haven't took the time to sit down and think of things that we can change. Like you just said, like there, if we a group of us came together and all right, what can what can we what can we do as a group? It's like if you see on Facebook, it's like, oh, if you got five friends and all y'all got ten thousand dollars, y'all can start a business. Mm-hmm. But guess what? Hey girl, you going to the club this weekend? Bottles on you. They'll do that, but hey, hey, you trying to start this business? Yeah, da, da, da. you won't get a call back. So we gotta change our mindset of what do we think's important. Um, as a culture, or mm-hmm. I think that's uh, important is to take it out of the personal realm, yep, and put it into a, a cultural perspective. Mm-hmm. That way, if it's a part of our culture, the sea change will benefit everyone. Yep, and it'll be normalized. Yep, when people start looking like what, really? That's what? Oh, okay. It's like oh, okay. Keep on moving on, but you're strengthening 
that number as far as people who are really ready to grow and progress and move on and make those changes sustainable and beneficial to us consciously. Yeah, that's like that we're on the east side of Indianapolis and you know how many east siders don't know about this place P30 because our mindset is something different. This is like everybody's not thinking of entrepreneurship or having their own business or doing something outside of a nine to five. I it's so many people that that like I, I would say I'm cool with. P30, what's that? Or when I pull up with the Uber, they'd be like, What's this over here? And I'm like, How do y'all live over here and not know this? I don't even live on this side of town and I know this. Or when there's certain events that's positive black people events that's we I, I didn't even hear about it. How did Okay, it's because our our mindset is totally different. You hear about the parties. You hear about when the celebrity, when the music celebrities is here and they having a concert, but you don't hear about the the stuff that they have for kids or or the positive stuff that they have. And I'd be so shocked that people don't know these things. But then someone told me like people mindset is different. And I was like, you're right, because how do you live on the east side and not know about this place? Or how do you live on the west side and don't know about the amp or different places like that? Like, how do you not know about this? And these are things for us. This is this P30 is for us mm -hmm. and people don't know about it. And then we make an excuse of, well, we don't got nothing. We do got something like at first I was kind of almost anti Indianapolis because I ain't from here and people from here treat you a little different. But as you grow older and you get connected with people and connections and events, you're like, it's actually stuff here to do. Like outside of the normal hood stuff to do. And there's stuff that networking events where you can get in contact with people and meet people and all this stuff. And people be like, oh, well, I don't know nobody because you ain't because you're going to the same places. You go into the same place and doing the same thing. And I just be shocked that we don't know these different things or um, what um, Tevin writing the books like there's a place all over town. There's no excuse why your child shouldn't be writing up. That's something that that can be a cultural thing that black kids know how to write books. Because guess what? They didn't want us to write books, read books, none of that. Right. Now we can do it on our own. Mm -hmm. Like, and this bigger than just saying, oh, I wrote a book. They used to tell us they didn't want us to write or read because they knew if we found information, we would get smarter than them. Now we're able to do that. Why wouldn't we do that? It makes no sense of some of the stuff that... We complain about, yep, conditioning. It's conditioning because, all right, we were punished for certain things. Mm -hmm. We learned how to read. We learned how to write. Mm -hmm. We killed for that. Yeah. We killed in front of your family for that. That's trauma. Yeah. That's trauma. And now we've learned scientifically that trauma can be passed on biologically, can be and is. It's passed on spiritually. So that when you have children... They're born with your fears. Mm. They're born with your fears. They're born with your um, attitudes. Ooh, trust me, I know that. <laughs> yeah. And when you plug all of that into a certain lifestyle, there's, there, you know, there's an outcome to that. Yeah. So we didn't just jump from where we were. To now, there was a whole process of <laughs> whole slowly process. unraveling us as a people from taking away jobs in our communities, taking away training in our communities, replacing it with drugs and guns. Now, again, don't get me wrong. Some people, you know, are going to fall on that side or a certain side of the line regardless because that's who they are. Yep. And OK, no harm, no foul. Do no harm. Do what you do. Do no harm. Great. All that unraveling that's taking place, moving elders out of the home or having children young so that by the time you are a grandparent, you're 40 years old and you're a grandparent. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's been done, but as a 40-year-old, what have you done in your life to solidify you as being able to be a grandparent that's mm. valuable. Did your children, you know, circumstances. It could be circumstances. You grew up poor. You, you know, your mom had you young. You had a baby young before you turned around twice. Yeah. You're 40 years old with grandchildren. 
you get you have that put together. You just haven't had the levels of experience necessary mm. that Big Mom and Big Daddy had because they were grandparents. They might have been grandparents at forty or fifty, but they grew up in another kind of time or society when things were slowed down quite a bit. They were able to come. Let me let me take care of the grandkids for a little while while you go work. Mm-hmm. Put yourself together, yep. as opposed to just being inundated with responsibilities. You know? Yeah, and you're yeah. still working, trying that- to get yourself together, and mm-hmm. now you got a whole generation of smaller children that you have to teach and. The- Parent in the middle might not mentally be where they need to be because they're younger as well. This is just one of many, many different situations. It's not a personal thing. Yeah. That's why as a culture, we have to start to put some things in place consciously as a people. Yep. Um, that will affect how we eat, how we drink, how we have our relationships, even how we, we vote. And who we vote for. Yeah. Who's out there? <laughs> I think we just need to be single as a country for a little bit. We don't need nobody in office. I think we just need to separate from folks because, yes. Yeah, but to what you to what you just said is it's so true. It's so many different layers we could peel back of why we're in certain situations. But it's <clears throat> like what you just said, like, as a person, I'm closer to 40, but like, I wouldn't want to be a grim. I'm not no granddad. Like I'm, I'm still, I'm you. still learning how to be a better dad. Like I still, I got a 19 year old, but I got a 10 year old that I'm still, it's a little boy that's about to go through puberty. That's about to start smelling himself, going through the girl stages, all these different things. I'm not ready for no, no, I'm like, and some people be thinking they're ready. Or like you said, is. Uh, people don't realize like how your parents grew up then that's how you like you don't realize that you're your parents i tell my mom sometimes you know you acting like you're you acting like your mama and she'd be like no i'm like yes you are and then i and certain stuff i do i'll be like okay i'm acting like mom or when i look at my son and his attitude his attitude is in my attitude at 38 his attitude is my attitude at 20 mm-hmm at 10 like he has he's 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 the unmature version of me and it's like oh my god was i this bad was i was that was my attitude like this and and it takes certain things to happen in your household to realize that because people don't even realize it it's people their parents ain't never had a house they ain't never had a house they don't even realize it they don't even realize it certain stuff or like when i got my first house with my family i was so proud like because it was bigger than the house I grew up in, mm-hmm. so I'm like, this is just our starter house, and it's bigger than the house I grew. I spent 13 years in, mm-hmm. so I was like, okay, I'm doing something. I'm doing something. Some yeah, I got some motion because you, you, you do become your parents or what you saw. Like um, the only successful marriage that I saw in person was my grandparents, and that was and and it ended because my grandfather died. But other than that, like when it came before I married. My kid's mom, I'm like, I don't want to get married. Married? Well, I don't know what that is. I don't want none of no parts of that until I got around men that were married. Mm-hmm. And then, and it takes that. But you got to be willing to listen. I think that's the biggest key um, to all of our culture's problem is listening. Because the older people don't want to listen to the younger the people. The younger people don't want to listen to the older people. Then you got someone in my age range that's the middle person that sees both sides and tries to to party with each ways because the older generation they know it all they don't want to they don't think nobody younger than them knows anything and then the younger generation they they ain't even been on earth long enough to know nothing but they think they know it all and it's like nobody wants to actually sit down and take time to listen to different generations so we can work together because as a 38 eight year old man i learn from kids every day mm-hmm. like every day I've, i'm learning something from a kid so you can't tell me you can't learn from somebody else so i think that's part of the problem we got to take our pride out of it take our ego and actually have a sit down and figure out hey how as a culture can we be better than we were yesterday We ain't got to go back 40. We ain't got to go that far. How can we be better than last month? 
You can take it to your own personal culture for your own family. Yeah. Um, I know for my family and for myself, we have a culture mm -hmm. in my family. Mm -hmm. Part of that culture is uh, peace of mind, mm. your health, your spiritual well-being. And what are you going to contribute to yourself, your family, and the world, your community? How can you contribute to that? Now, uh, we don't observe holidays per se. We're not religious, so I'm not mandated by a day on a calendar mm -hmm. to jump up and go do this and go do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of that, I'm able to focus freely on... Oh teaching and showing my children how to stay economically free, mm -hmm. uh, how to continue to keep their sovereignty as individuals and as a collective, to be able to uh, generate opportunities for our family mm -hmm. uh, is a part of our culture. We live all in common in my family. Mm -hmm. part of our culture. Does that mean that nobody has their own anything? That's not it. It means that as a family, we consciously come together mm -hmm. in order to pull our resources, to pull them together, to benefit our family mm -hmm. on a stable basis, on a continual basis. We aren't just related by blood. Yep. We're a unit yep. that has goals. Yep. Through the unit that we all sit down and talk about. Yep. And that's a part of my family's personal culture. And that's that, that's perfect to we don't a lot of us don't have that. Like if I look back on my family, I don't know what culture we have. Like, um we didn't we didn't really do I mean holidays, yeah, uh, yeah. But we didn't really have anything. It took until being around uh, my son's mom and going to her families and seeing how families actually operate when they have family function. It was like, oh, I like this. I want to go to different family events because I didn't have that as a kid. So as when I was married and we were together, we had our own little cultural or and she still does some of the stuff with the kids. But you have your own stuff and that helps your kids understand what it what that looks like or how to um have some character about themselves like when they go out because of the things that their parents are teaching them or just that that household culture i think more of us need to be like that and i'm i'm somewhat that way with my kids like certain stuff that i talk to my son about other people might not talk to their kids or talk to them how in that form. I've never sugarcoat when I talk to my kids. I try not to use cuss words because I do curse, but I never sugarcoat. I give them it raw because I'm like, I tell my son all the time, don't nobody care about you. No, you go out in this world. Don't don't nobody care that 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 uh that you lost the game or that you missed a hundred shots. So there are certain ways that you need to act and 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 portray yourself as a man. Like I never tell them that crying is bad, mm -hmm. but whining is. Like you whining for what? You whining because your mama told you no, and you whining where there's tears and you on your feel. And it's certain how I explain it to them is like, dude, you can't allow your feelings to get you or allow somebody to get you so mad that you ain't here bawling and and so upset that you can't even finish a game or that you didn't got a technical in the game or that you didn't got into it with one of your teammates because somebody said something to you. And it's, it's a, uh, being a father, I understand the importance of having that kind of conversation because all little boys and little girls don't be able to have that conversation. It might not always be right. I might not say the right words, but just me being able there to help and correct him in a moment of needing to learn is important because some, I didn't have that. I have a dad, but he wasn't there all the time. He didn't show me stuff that I was supposed to learn. I had to learn it on my own. So in that, in, in my culture, in my household, it's just me being there. Yeah, me, me I was being there. Say that's super important. And the same thing with my with like my that. daughter. Like she don't always she she take three weeks to text back. She only texts if she wants some money. Uh, back to back, but she she always tell me you always there, mm -hmm. and 
that's that's the thing you always want to show your kids because I, t- I keep it real hey son you in the house this weekend brother i ain't got no money but i'm here with you what you want to do you want to play the game you want to do uno just me being there with him rather than us going out or we always doing something sports it don't always got to be basketball so now just talking to you understanding what my mini culture is and some things that i can add to it because when you have that that gives your kids some type of structure to go out in the world and understand life a little bit better because some parents do sugarcoat and coddle their kids and then they wonder when their kids go out why they kids dealing with these problems because you you made your kid think it's easy breezy out here it's not especially if you black it's not it's not easy for us at all so you got to have some type of structure or some type of culture at your household to prepare your kids to go out into the real world because if you don't they gonna come back and be, um, be under um, under you the rest of their life and it's like mm, is that the way that we supposed to teach our kids well, you have to have parents that are equipped to teach emotional intelligence and emotional regulation. That, that is true. Cause we, cause I didn't learn that. I'm, I'm only 38. I ain't become a man. So I was 30. I'm still becoming one in the emotional side. It's a process it, <laughs> yeah. it, for everybody. Nobody, yeah. nobody jumps into it. Like, Hey, I got all the answers. <laughs> no, you get no. stuffed up and dragged up in this business. This yeah. Place. So, Emotional regulation and intelligence is something that you show children because mm-hmm. they sure watch you harder than they listen to you. Yes. Are you been hollering and screaming all the time? Mm-hmm. Um, do you know how to respond respectfully? Uh, how about your conflict resolution skills? Those are all a part of culture because there are other there are cultures that have emotional regulation as a part of their culture. Yep. And we, we, we don't at all. If you seen, if you were seen to have lost control of your emotions up uh, at that point, nobody's listening to nothing that you say, not that you out the pocket. None of that is just like, thank you for your input. Yeah. Cause a, a lot of Wait, times, yeah, we'll come back around. Cause you, you know, we understand you feeling it at this point. Yep. And we can understand that and process our way through that. Those are things that can be taught. You got to have parents, heads of household, (laughs) who are willing to be taught Mm -hmm. emotional regulation and to go through their own healing process and their own journey. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's real. You got to sit back, think about it. Next time that situation comes around, you have to rewire your brain to respond differently. Yep. Um, uh, and ego has a lot to do with it, a lot to do with it. But just the ability to want to calm down and understand for the collective betterment of your family. Yes. As, as uh, someone who is one day going to be an ancestor, what do you want to be remembered for? Yep. In your family. And if you're just the person who bought that house that was went from we went from this house to this house in my generation. All okay, great. You made that leap. Now you got to teach your children how to do that. Yep. Actively like this is how you buy a house and you start them off on that process. As opposed to everybody running the same loop, every generation running around the same track. Somebody's got to open up the gate so that you can get off that track and start going where you would like to go. (laughs) Yeah. So you opened up that gate. You made a generational change. At this point, your children have an understanding that, okay, dad bought a house, nicer house than what he grew up in. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, all right, Dad, so what you have to do? Get your credit score together. Okay, nobody taught us how to do it, so we struggled through trying to figure it out after we messed up our credit. Yeah. So now you've got kids. You can start them in on, okay, this is what you want to do when you get a job. This is what you want to sign up for. You want to get a skill. Always should be able to do something with your hands. That way you can keep your bread right. Yep. On your own, you can dict- dictate those terms. Yep. I think that that's something that would be a major sea change culturally for us is if 
just in our families. By the time you graduate from high school, we're going to need a trade. Yep. It can be hair. It can be plumbing. It can be electrical. Within, Something. Within five years, how much would that upgrade our finances? Because we're, as a people, we've already got plenty of money. Yeah. We actually have plenty of money. Mm-hmm. It's the emotional intelligence and learning how to use it. And that, you know, that you don't have to have a lot. If you know how to use it properly and you know how to make those moves on things that matter. A dad might not be the one. What about uncle so-and-so? He knows how. Come on. Come on. As a part of this culture of our family, yep. let's show what we know. We can come together and barbecue, but okay, we're all here. We're all together. When are we going to come together and do something to teach the children and our family? What are we doing? Okay, we can plan outings. We can plan parties. We can plan coordinated outfits, which is awesome. Yeah. I'm not I'm not biting on none of that. But yeah. what else can we plan to bring together for our children so that they can be solid, learning wise? Yep. Because everybody can't pass houses and cars and savings accounts. Everybody can't nope. pass that long, but I can I can show you how to keep a little bread in your pocket and how to make a little something in the next generation. Oh, I can show you how to buy a house. I can show you a tray. Yep. And right that that third generation got it and gone at this point. They're yep. financially able to get something and keep it. Yeah. That is that that is so true. I told my daughter that. Like when you go to school, don't go to school just to say you got a degree and you finish. You want to be able to come out and be able to be a boss, be able to have your own or know exactly what you're doing. And I told her when she was doing hair in high school, learn, keep learning how to do that. Because when you get to college, that's going to be the way you make your money. And not, what's she doing? She got it. She in the shop making. And like with my son, he was six. One Christmas, I got him a business, his own clothing line. And it's like. Give them something that they can <clears throat> they can have ownership of and they can use. And like you said, sometimes we will buy our kids stuff instead of actually showing them how to do something that can last long or make them like you could give your kid a business now. And, you know, they might not do nothing with it maybe the first two years, but then they like, oh, I can make money off this. Now they're seeing that. Now you can you can give them the steps of what they need. It, my son was six. Uh, he OK, he's six. He wasn't really on it. Now when he he has the bit and ain't going away. Mm-hmm. So he could be like, hey, dad, we still got that. All right. Well, I'm in middle school now. I want to do it. Now he got a clothing line. Now he can do whatever he wants with it. And we got to. And like you said earlier, it's up to us parents, us, the the older generation, the, the people to get the healing that we need to be able to help. Because you can't help somebody if you're still going through your own issues. Well, you can, because I've been in worse situations than somebody else and been able to give them a, a motivation or something. But you want to be able to heal your issue, heal your problem so that you can you can pass along the good energy or the good traits of of your family instead of the bad traits because it's easy to pass along that bad attitude the uh, bad money management the gambling the drinking the smoking that's that's easy to do but we don't never like you said we don't never hey let's sit down and come up with business ideas or let's sit down and come up with uh, a plan to do whatever it is that's that can help us down the road we um we always complain and watch the game there's people right now at the house packed together drinking beer watching the game eating wings everybody gonna leave home and go back to their struggles instead of hey man let's have a meeting while we watching the game Let's talk about some stuff that we can change while we're while we're doing the fun stuff. And then you'll start to realize, uh, do I need to spend three hours watching this game? Do I need to spend time going here? Because I, I watch a game. I have a game on, but I'm working. Mm-hmm. I got it on for background noise. Like and I and like people be like, oh, you're not into like I don't care if my team lose. I can't control what Jordan Love does um, on Sunday uh, Sunday night. I can't control what Jason Tatum does on the court when he's playing basketball. I control only can control me. So if my team lose, I don't know if they uh, whatever issue they had. So it's like control what you can control in your household, and then that's how you'll be able to control 
what's going on out. Um, this has been a great conversation. I don't kind of want it to end, but we over the time for the, the next people, which they kind of uh, held us up. So we got a little time. But um, uh, what did I want to say? I love this kind of conversation with someone because it makes you think. It makes you think of what you're not doing and what you can be doing um, in the fact of being a better black person um, on, on the things of being able to help the next generation because we can see what's going out on the Facebook and on the social media, but what's going on in our homes? How can we fix that? And I think that's a lot what I've learned. Like <clears throat> there's little things you can do in your household to make the world a better place if you can essentially do it in your household and it can trickle to your neighborhood and it can trickle to your city and to your state and all those different things. But I appreciate this conversation because it definitely um, had me thinking and it still has me thinking of certain things that I can do in my household or stop making the excuse that my the generation before me didn't do something. So I appreciate that. Um, tell people... How they can reach you on social media or the internet. Everybody don't be on social media. I, um, but tell them how they can reach you. And then give us an underdog quote. It could be your quote. It could be a quote you you know live by, whatever. But we need an underdog quote. Okay. Um, I can be reached um, online at Ambrosia Nutrition and Beauty. Uh, please go to AmbrosiaNutritionAndBeauty.com and check out uh, what we have to offer there. Everything is premium and or handmade. Uh, and we ship directly. And an underdog quote. Hmm. I say like three of them, and I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. I got them jumbled up yeah. together. Divine intelligence, of, divine intelligence of my subconscious mind. Show me the answers I seek and how to accomplish my goals. I love that it. would be my underdog quote. I love it. And I love this conversation because it did take you, I could tell it took you a little minute to warm up. And when we warmed up, you sat back and we had a great conversation, which usually happens on here because every conversation is different, is meant to be different, and is meant for me to learn and the audience to learn. So I greatly appreciate your knowledge and, and what you brought to the table today. Uh oh, I gotta do my uh subscribe. So underdog talk on YouTube, uh your favorite podcast platform. Go and grab my son's book, Youth Cheat Code on Amazon by Christian Jones. Go grab my book on Amazon from Underdog to Top Dog, Seven Steps to Academic Success. Um You got any product you want want to tell people to go grab? Absolutely. Please go to my website, AmbrosiaNutritionAndBeauty.com. I offer three supplement brands as well as handmade soaps and Yoni Care products. All right. I'm trying to think because I usually be having some announcements. Uh, oh, oh, nope. Don't got no announcements yet. But we, uh, my son will be having... Um, won't be until October, but there's a, a bunch of book signings and different things that he'll be doing. Um, then try to think, how do I got any announcements? Nope, I don't. I appreciate you again. Um, you got me thinking about Mexican food because I didn't got hungry over Man. here. Yeah, Man. I, I like <laughs> ready to go eat. Yeah, because when I be sitting here and I be doing this, I, I do like to eat, but I don't. I don't know why. Like before I go speak and talk, I don't like to eat, but then I work up a, a sweat and I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. So I think that's it. I think that's all I got. I don't got no, um, yeah, we're going to just end it there. Uh, give us a closing word. Well, thank you for having me. No problem. And I hope all is well with you all the time. Now on that note, keep being great. Boom. Boom. Oh.